Fendi and I are going to be doing a talk, as you probably know already, on Groovy. Um, so it's less of a talk and more of us sort of programming live um, to show you some of the differences between Groovy and Java. So there's going to be a lot of mismatched brackets and null pointer exceptions. Please forgive us as we try and um, do our best to do coding in front of all you people. Um, we're going to be talking about Groovy from the perspective of people who are familiar with Java. Um, so we're going to be starting off with a bunch of Java classes and then slowly converting them to Groovy. And there's some cool little um, nuances with Groovy that allow us to do that um, in a nice sort of way. Um, so sorry for sitting down again because we're going to be live coding. It's difficult to stand up. Hopefully you can all see the screen and we're sort of sitting underneath it, hopefully. Um, but yeah, so without further ado, I'm going to introduce Groovy really quick and then we'll get to doing some code. So what is Groovy? Um, it's a superset of Java, mostly. Um, so anything, any syntax that is in Java is also in Groovy. There are some exceptions to that. So uh, most notably in the examples we're going through, um, the Java lambdas aren't supported yet in Groovy. Um, but for the most part, uh, Java is a subset of Groovy. So if you have a Java file and you rename it to a Groovy file, the Groovy compiler will happily compile and run that code for you. Um, it's object-oriented, although it has some functional stuff um, that you might be familiar with from languages like JavaScript and that kind of thing. Um, it has some cool stuff you can do. It's dynamically typed rather than statically typed. Um, so you don't need to declare the type of a variable at the start, again, similar to a scripting language. Um, and it's been around for a little while. It first appeared in 2003. So that's, um, yeah, quite a while ago now, isn't it? Um, how popular is it? So here's a quick couple of graphs. So the first one there is just Google search trends for Groovy over time, so you can see um, it sort of peaked around 2009 and it's sort of had steady-ish interest. That last point that goes down a lot is just because the year's not over yet, so don't get too worried. Um, and then the second graph is more kind of a comical effect. It's not just one graph. That's actually a graph of both the Java and Groovy search trends. So if you look really closely at the bottom, you'll see a couple of tiny spikes of Groovy. Um, so it's very much a niche language at the moment compared to something like Java. So um, there's not too many people who are aware of it, not too many people who use it. So we thought it would be a good candidate um, for giving one of these talks just to let you all know what it is uh, and sort of show you what it, what it looks like. So um, here's some typical technologies that you might see when you start off with a Groovy project. So obviously there's Groovy and there's Java, which I assume that you've all heard of because this meetup's named after it. Um, and then Gradle, which is a build tool, is very similar to Maven. And in fact, you may have already used it because you can use it um, to do Java stuff as well. Um, and CodeNark is a static code analysis tool that can be really good. Um, that can basically look through some common mistakes that you might have in your code and make sure your code quality is reasonably good. Uh, and there's the GVM as well, which helps you to install and manage your Groovy version. So we're going to be demoing all of these today, except for CodeNark, because we're too scared. <laughs> Cool, so without further ado, it will show you some code. Cool. Sorry about that. Right, thanks for that, John. So um, I'm going to show you just um, on three, using three command line commands to quickly how to start up uh, programming in Groovy. So assuming you already installed Java, you already have Java installed in your system, and I have a virtual machine here to show you that. Is that big enough? I might be a bit bigger. Actually, kill your shell. There you go. Shows up. So the command is really, really simple. You start with that command: curl minus s, which is silent to get gvm tool.net and then pipe it to bash. Essentially, this guy, getgvmtool.net, is a shell script. And I'll show you in a bit. And you, you can find all the details in GVM tools as well. It's just over here. So I, I'm not actually inventing this. This is a, already a, a tool that's a, available. Just by typing that command, you type it into your bash It'll actually install uh, GVM, which is the Groovy version manager. For people who might have done Ruby before, it's similar to RVM, but instead of just doing a uh, version management for the, uh, the Ruby thing, in, it, in this case, the GVM uh, does several other things uh, than just managing the versions of Groovy. In particular, it is able to manage different versions of different stuff. And in particular, the one that I want to show you is here, using your GVM. You can, once you have GVM installed, 
You can then do a GVM install Gradle. That's the build tool that we're going to use, which is conveniently written in Groovy as well. I already have G uh, Gradle installed, so it shouldn't be taking too long. Uh, it'll download about, I don't know, 60 megabytes uh, zip file, then extract it, and then install it. And after that, you do a GVM install Groovy. And in this case, it's already installed as well. And off you go. You're ready to develop uh, in Groovy. So let's just make a test folder here. And to, uh, to start up, all you have to do is really do this. So I, I lied. It's not three commands, it's four. So you get the GVM, you install Gradle Groovy, and then you actually spin this up, and you have a Groovy library. So Gradle is not install. Sorry about that. It's Gradle, Gradle use 2.5, which then for the session, it'll use that. Let me type it again. Gradle init dash dash type Groovy library. And there you go. I'm um, actually going to show you the package structure. You have a source, main, Groovy, with a library Groovy, and library tests. And you're ready to code. I have a group library test as well. And you can start building stuff just by Gradle build. That actually compiles it into uh, a target, and it compiles down to JVM bytecode. Compile test Groovy, download some stuff. And yeah, there you go, build successful. And you have a built folder, which has all your files there. We're not actually going to start from a Groovy project. We're actually going to start from a Java project. So again, this talk is about Groovy from the perspective of a Java developer. So what we have here. To start with, this is actually a Java project. You can see it's main Java with a library person. It's actually using this. Uh, we initialized this using the same uh, Gradle tool. Just instead of a dash dash type Groovy library, we put a Java library there. And we start with a person class. It's a basic POJO. Imagine you have a person class. You have three uh, properties, and you have three getters with a constructor that actually allows you to initialize it. The tests. Some people, some of you might think this is probably redundant, but it's it's here to illustrate a point. We have a test, three tests to actually uh, make sure that when once you instantiate the person, you actually have those available from that um, from that class. So I will then quickly do a Gradle clean clean test and test. It tells you uh, don't worry about the library method, but we have three passing tests. OK, so what do we do in order to actually start converting to Groovy? First of all, a bit of Gradle thing. Uh, in order for a Gradle to actually start doing stuff uh, with your code, you actually have to apply plugins to it. So we'll add that in. Hey, Gradle, we're actually a Groovy project. So add plugin Groovy. And of course, Groovy is not standalone, so you actually have a dependency as well. And I'll cheat because I already have here where the, uh, let's see, sorry. There you go. This is the dependency. Copy. So this is the Groovy dependency. Now you add that, and then I'm just rerunning the test just to make sure that things are still working. It is. Now what I'm going to do is add a new Groovy source. So we're actually going to double the number of tests available here. Nope. Uh, did you rename the classes? Oh, yes. I did not rename the classes. Thank you. It's amazing how hard it is to type in front of 100 people <laughs> to remember everything. <laughs> That's why we have a pair. Yeah. On a separate note, we're actually plugging the benefits of pairing yes. in front of 100 people as well. Okay. 
Yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah, code swarming. Quad also swarming. Good, good technique. Yeah. <laughs> I actually didn't do that. I did. There we go. Should do. Fendi has some late BIM skills. Uh, public class and then a constructor, yep. No? Uh, in your groovy test, I know, but rename that. I thought so. Groovy person, groovy person, groovy person, groovy person. It's actually failing on the Java test. Oh, no. Uh, maybe the clean helped or something. Oh, yeah. Clean test. Hey. There you go. We have three additional tests for the groovy person test as well as the person test. So that's to illustrate. This is because we, we didn't actually, there's some renamings that needs to be done. But to illustrate, uh, a Java class renamed to groovy class in most cases would work. So what I'm going to do now is to show the um, semicolon is actually optional. Get rid of it. Same here. Get rid of the semicolons. It would still work. Yep, still on green. And now I'm going to do something interesting in the case that uh, a groovy in groovy when you uh, put these properties here, it actually automatically generates getter and setter for you. So I'm going to get rid of these. And you can see that it would still work. Privacy modifier. <coughs> Privacy modifier? Yeah, I think there's, because they're private, does that still work? Interesting. I'll get to that later. Um, <laughs> I'll, I'll start with the privacy modifier. So getting rid of the privates and publics would still make things work. Percent S. Oh, it's because I didn't change the test. The test is actually trying to get, get me. No. That should still it? work. That's should still work. Yep. Interesting. Get rid of the privacy modifier or the accessors as well as in the test. So in Groovy, by default, I think um, methods and classes are public, and uh, instance variables are private with a getter and setter. OK, so so far what we've done is we've removed the accessors, and we've removed the semicolons, and it still works. Uh, I'll try again, because really I should be able to get rid of these, right? Yeah, separately. Yeah, OK. Yeah. I think so. There you go. Awesome. So we're able to get rid of the um, getters. So another thing that I wanted to do is just to clean up the test a bit. So and John is going to talk to about type inference a bit later, but you can get rid of the groovy person because it kind of knew. I mean, to start with the one over here, because you're actually instantiating a groovy person, it actually knows that you are instantiating a groovy person. So you don't have to tell what this variable is, and it still would work. Save that. It's still OK. And this guy. So what I'm about to do is introduce a default constructor. And get rid of this. And over here, because we're not sending three um, uh, constructor arguments anymore, instead we can just pass in a map. And here as well. Key. 
and it still works. Finally, just with, uh, with Groovy, uh, you, typically not, if you typically use Spock for the testing framework. We opt to use uh, JUnit because I think it's, uh, you don't actually have to learn a new syntax to do testing, which is always a plus. But we are given um, a new power assert, which is slightly better than how this looks like. And John is going to show that in a bit as well. So instead of doing assert equals, we can just say um, to test assert name. Uh, before we do that, actually, I'll change these. Because that's the magic. We still use get name, but in the class, up the class here. We don't actually have any getters, even though over here we use the getters. So really, this is not required. Sorry, RG. Without the, because it's no longer a method, it's just a property. And that's actually an alias to call get and the property name. So if you have a plain old Java object, um, even if it's not groovy, if it does have that standard convention of get property name, you'll still be able to use that notation when you use the class in groovy, which is kind of nice. Finally, really, if you want to change it, you can just say to test that name equals equals John, for example. I'm just going to do one of them just to illustrate. And then you can do the. You can imagine how it's going to be done on the other side. And it's the pass. Uh, yeah, yeah. So if you. Yeah. We can try it, actually. That's a good point. I, don't, I never tried it. Magic. I think because you have like um, maps and stuff that don't. Like you can have mixed different types in for map keys and stuff like that. Yeah, it is. Obviously, that's because I assigned this to def. If you don't actually, if you um, assign it to groovy person, then that probably won't work. Uh, that's pretty much it from me. There's some some other um, changes that I want to do, but I'm keen to um, show you some more stuff that John has on his plate. So, um, what? Just finally, before I move on to John, what I wanted to show you is our Pojo, which. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure. I haven't used Spock too much. Too much we haven't used it. Spock as much, sorry. Yes, to J unit. The comfort of the familiar. <laughs> so the assert um, that you see, it's, it's a groovy keyword. So it's not like the Java one where you have just the A to be enabled. It's completely separate. And it behaves differently. It does behave differently, yeah. yeah. Less magic is better sometimes, so we prefer to use something that we understand instead of a um, Spock that we need to learn and deal with all the intricacies and yeah. stuff, gotchas as well. Yeah. Just quickly, um, the class person starts out as a normal Java class with all the ceremonial code, and then you decide which one you want to put setters and getters against. With Groovy, you end up with this. I don't think you even need that constructor even. Yeah, you probably you don't yeah. need to. Concise. Cool. So let me check out the code and hand over to John. So do those properties also have setters? Yes. Yep. And can you disable setters and still allow getters? No. <laughs> that's, a, that's another thing which is uh, still um, ongoing discussion. I think uh, they. They've been talking about implementing it for Groovy 2.0, but now it's been pushed all, all the way to Groovy 3.0. But from Groovy, you can access pretty much anything from anywhere. Beg your pardon? Do you need to define the default constructor, did you say? Um, no, no. So it's still a default constructor. So if you don't define it, um, so if there's no constructors defined, it'll still have the default constructor. Yeah. I might be wrong, but I think if, if we take that to the Pojo, you 
make the instance variable spider and then you give it the accurate for each of them. You can then get them using the property notation. Yeah. So you can't yeah. set them in a property notation. If you um, read only. <coughs> yeah, we have to use the private key read only. Yeah, that's it. But that's but that's, that's if you rank them private and add headers, you can still access them using yep. the property notation. Yep. But you, but there's no so currently you could go Okay, interesting. Right, cool. Hand over to you, John. Thanks, Wendy. Uh, let me just fiddle with this for a few minutes. If I can get it on. Okay, cool. Um, so, uh, I'm going to be going through a, co a couple of interesting sort of things you can do with collections in Groovy. Um, so like a lot of sort of semi-functional kind of languages, it's got some cool stuff you can do with collections. Um, I'm actually not going to be starting from this one, even though it looks like uh, the one that's sort of the most scary and complicated. Um, I'm actually going to go straight to this one. So this um, uses the new Java 8 syntax. So if I actually just uh, copy this file and rename it to a Groovy file, it's not going to compile. But um, just to show you the test as well, so you can see what that's supposed to be doing. So we have a find gym method, wherever it is. Uh, so find gym finds the first person that is Jim, which in this case is the person with the name J James Kirk. Um, so if we have a look, you can see that in Java, uh, we're using the new Java 8 syntax. So it does a, a stream. I'm not totally familiar with this, by the way, but um, it does a stream, and then you can pass in a lambda, um, which will then say this will return true if the name equals James Kirk, get the first item, uh, get it, assign that to Jim, and then return Jim. You can probably just have a return statement here, but um, that's the way it's written at the moment. So to convert this to Groovy, the first thing I'm going to do. Let's start from green, just make sure that so, oh, yeah. the task that's class. That's a good idea, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, so clean test. So hopefully it's green. Yeah, yeah. cool. That's good. That's, all, yeah. that's a good start. Awesome. Um, so let's copy that over. So put it in the Groovy folder and name it Groovy so the compiler knows what to do with it. And I'll go ahead and call it Groovy Utils as well, just to avoid some confusion. So if it's in here, demo Groovy Utils, awesome. And I'll do the same with the test as well. Uh, move, copy, Groovy. Groovy utils dot groovy. Cool. Uh, that's a capital G. Okay. And rename the classes inside yep. as well. Go through that. Um, percent S. Uh, so find utils, rename to groovy utils. Uh, GC, right? Yep. Yes. Uh, yep. Is that it? Oh, that's easy. All right. Uh, oh, whoops. Uh, I think I just killed the window, actually. No. Uh, that's fine. Yep. <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> nice. Very good. Let's see if we can use pseudoscience to revive him. <laughs> cool. Um, so, back. Fix up the test. So, percent s uh, utils groovy utils gc. Uh, yep, 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 yep. That's it. Cool. Let's run the test. So let's see how many mistakes I just made. Can I show the clean test as well? And then oh, yeah, because of course, yeah, the Java 8 stuff, like I said before, I was obviously just demonstrating. Um, the Java 8 <laughs> stuff doesn't, uh, isn't supported currently by Groovy. So um, the solution in Groovy is going to look quite a lot different anyway. So I'm just going to go ahead and just delete all the implementation, um, which is obviously going to make the test fail. Um, but hopefully it should be the only test that fails. So find Jim, uh, you can just return. 
is probably a good time to talk about as well. So Groovy has implicit return. So if I just say null, then it's just going to return null. So um, it just returns the result of the last evaluated expression, which is kind of nice. Um, and you'll see an example of how that can make it a bit cleaner uh, in a minute. So hopefully now that we've done that, we should get a nice failing. Yep, good. Cool. Uh, so we've got two failing tests. Hopefully they're both around the find gym. I think they will be. Um, oh yeah, that's another thing that I'm going to be demonstrating in a second. That's all right. Um, so finds the first person called Jim failed as we expected. Um, so what can we do? What's the most concise way we can solve this in Groovy? So um, well, there's a really nice thing in Groovy called a closure. You may have heard of closure. Um, so in Groovy, it's a bit different. So if you have a list, um, you can call a method called find, um, which is a groovy method. Files, if I can spell find. Um, so groovy adds a whole bunch of really useful utility methods to all of your collections. Um, there's like things like find, find all, and some a lot of really, really obscure ones that you probably have to look up that aren't obvious what they do. Um, but they make working with lists really easy. So um, this is closure, a closure. So what I'm doing is I'm calling this method find. And as the argument, I'm passing in this closure. Um, brackets like this, so normally you do this to call a method. In Groovy, brackets are actually optional for method calls, but usually you always put them in, because otherwise it becomes completely unreadable. Um, but I think the main reason they've done it is exactly for this case here. So if I want to pass in a closure, I can just do that. I don't have to worry about wrapping this in brackets and having close curly, close bracket. I can just chuck that in straight away. Um, so Groovy closures, the way they work, what you do is you put the variables that you expect to get in up here. So if I have a person, and then I can now access that person here. But I'm not going to do that, because I can actually do this uh, with even less code, because the find, and actually most of the collection methods that Groovy supplies will have a default argument, um, and it's just, just called it. So if I just say it.name equals James Kirk. James? Uh, James, get rid of what, sorry? The null. The null? Oh, yeah, yeah, that's not going to return what I want. OK, cool. Um, so now we have one line. Uh, that's going to iterate through this list, run this test against it, and find the first thing that passes. At least that's what I hope. Uh, so let's go run that. We'll still get one failure because of that other thing that I plan to show. Yep, cool. Cool, thanks, Mindy. Awesome. Um, yep, yep. Uh, so the other thing I want to show you is why that test is failing, which is quite interesting. It's quite subtle. Sorry. Yeah. Yes. Um, I think I don't know actually. No. No. So the equals equals will just do a two equals. Yep. Yep. Um, so. I'll show you why that test is failing. And I'll start off by showing you the Java code. So in these tests, we have something that says something about overloading. Yep. So it uses the correct method with overloading. So in here, we have an object called object, creatively. Um, it's being bound to a string. Um, and we're calling this do the overload method, which is fairly cryptic in what it actually does. Um, so I'll show you. So if we look at utils, so there are two overload methods. One takes an object, one takes a string. And if you call the object one, it will return this string. If you call the string one, it will return this other string. And so you can see in this particular test, it's saying, OK, make sure that the method that you called is object. And as you probably know already, because Java does this binding at compile time, um, it doesn't necessarily know that this object is a, actually a string, so it's going to call the object notation. Now, if I actually look at the Groovy test, um, which is probably So I've just got the same test as before. Um, but however, it's failing, because this is actually using the string method. So if I change this to string, and I run the tests, mm -hmm. uh, we should get a pass. Yep. 
you so you can see that Groovy does this binding at runtime. So even though this <coughs> is being bound to an object at runtime, it knows that this is actually a string, and it goes ahead and calls that string method. So often what you'll do in these situations, rather than, um, oh, sorry, Fendi, can you get it, put it back? Cool. Rather than um, using an overloaded method, you might just use a def or something like that if you want to do the same thing, because um, Groovy doesn't necessarily care what type it is. As long as it has the same a method with that name, it'll just do whatever with it. Um, another thing I'll quickly demonstrate as well is something that can make your tests a little bit nicer. Um, so let's modify. Finds the first person called Jim. Um, so if I want, I can actually change this whole thing and use a string. So I can say, um, should find the person Jim, oh, be respectful, Jim, in the list. Save that. And just for um, the sake of showing you what the assert looks like when it fails, because it is quite, um, quite nice. I'll use the standard assert. So Jim should equal result. Uh, and I'm going to not have a person called Jim here. Cool. So now when I run these tests, uh, sorry, when I run these tests, it's going to fail. Cool. And it's going to, can you open the report thing? So it generate, uh, that's the other thing, Gradle will generate this little test summary for you, which shows you what tests are failing. And you'll see the output of the Groovy asserter. If we just open that. Uh, so that wasn't as interesting as I was hoping for. But um, if you have a big dot chain, essentially it's going to show you the value of everything within the chain. So you can see the result was null. If I had done like Jim dot get something, it would say Jim was this kind of object. When I called get something, it returned this. You're expecting this. Um, and it just shows you the value of all of the different objects which is really nice, and it makes it a lot easier to find out um, what's wrong. So you want to flip back. So cool. everything on that line that failed is output what the value of the Exactly, value. yes, yep. So it makes it a bit nicer rather than um, an assertion or a matcher where you kind of get a more generic message. It actually goes and prints out all that stuff for you, which is nice, because that's usually, at least for me, the, the next step anyway, is to go and put a uh, print thing in to see what actually is going on. Or you put a debugger and then start hovering your mouse in your IDE or something. Yeah, exactly. Um, so I might hand it back over to Fendi because he's got some really cool stuff to show you. And if we have time, um, I'll start converting some more of that class over. And as part of that handover, I should give him the microphone. Can I just point out, I think you can do reference quality if you give methods. Yes. No, it's true. Yes. Uh, as far as I know, the it, it's totally correct. As far as I know, the double equality is for value, though. Yeah. So um, what I'm going to do now is actually open Groovy Shell. Uh, it's just another thing that is interesting to show you. Uh, the nice thing with Groovy is um, if you want to start um, playing around with code, just trying to figure out whether your syntax is correct or um, how to manipulate lists and whatnot, you can just open up Groovy Shell, Groovy SH. And it'll open up Groovy for you here. And then you can do stuff like, hey, I have a list of thing. How do I, for example, find everything that is larger than um, it larger than 2, for example? You do that. OK, cool. I, I know how to do that now. Um, what I want to show you from this Groovy shell is instead how to do, uh, um, not how to do, but um, string, until, string interpolations in Groovy. Uh, this is one of the gotchas in Groovy. So um, when you start converting Java file to Groovy, if you have some string in there, if, and if you have dollars inside your string uh, in particular, uh, you need to be pretty careful. Because um, this guy in Groovy can be two different objects. In Java, this is always going to be Java lang string. In Groovy, it depends on what you type in here. That will be a Java lang string. That will be a Java a Groovy lang g string. This is a special type of string inside um, Groovy. But if it's in Java, it's actually a, a string type. And I'll show you uh, because that, that's uh, going to be relevant for interpolation. Oh, the other thing is if you have that, 
Is there any? I think your projector is lagging. Oh, the projector is lagging. I think it's the airplay. Let me disconnect and reconnect out. Oh. So just on Fendi's point about the differences between the strings, tools like CodeNark will help you. Um, so if you use the double quotes and you don't need to, it will warn you. Um, it'll have the actual error messages, unnecessary G-string, which is a bit awkward to see if you're pairing, but um, <laughs> it warns you if, you if you might be using something that you didn't intend. So um, those kind of tools are really useful, especially if you're just starting out. So yeah, in CodeNark, they will it'll tell you that um, if you have double quotes and you're not going to need it, they'll complain and ask you to change it to single quotes, which the reason is because that guy is always going to be a Java length string. Yeah, yeah it is not yes. HR. All right. But so, so, sure. so useful. <laughs> right. So what I wanted to show you, that's in the bottom, which is not reset. So it'll be in the top, so it's easier for you to see. Groovy shell. <sighs> it's always open up. OK. So I'm going to start with an initial string. And for a reason, I don't know, initial. It's going to be obvious. And I'm just going to print line. This is how we do string interpolation in Ruby. Dollar, initial string. Initial. So you interpolate that by putting it into a dollar sign. Now say I have a, I don't know, initial, initial map instead. So I can do the dot notation. Can I do dot notation mark map? Uh, yeah. No, yeah. I need a class, yeah. I need a class, don't I? To do what, say, dot Dot key. notation, yeah. yeah you, can use dot, you, can get, you can do dot key for a map. Yeah. yeah. Uh, if you are going to use dot notation, my key value, let's make it more interesting. Oh. Nothing you have to say dot key. The value. Ah, oh, dot key, sorry. I see. Because it's uh, an object in here. here. Yep. Sorry. That needs to be key set anyway, right? So I need to go first or something. Uh, I think that should work. I don't I'm know. Try it. Yay. Hello. Ah, right. OK. <laughs> Magic. All right, OK. So just to show you that with the notation, the curlies are actually optionals. You can still open it up if you have magic there. Um, the other thing I wanted to show you is uh, this string interpolation actually works anywhere in the code, which is super magical. Initial map dot, wait for it. That guy. It's going to get complicated. Is it? I don't know. <laughs> Probably. Ah, uh, oh, that's what I want. So what I'm doing right now is I'm actually accessing magic under initial map, but I don't actually have to type it. This is very, very meta. What it's doing is um, it's constructing magic here and actually eventually access the magic property under initial map. Now there's other ways to actually use string interpolation. One way is from the curly, which I've shown you, is actually just evaluating uh, plain groovy code. There's another way, which is uh, you can actually pass a closure into this thing. And then I'll, I'll show you why it's interesting. Back to initial string, init, and um, my string equals to an interpolation of init. And then I modify initial string, changed. And I print it out. My string. What should happen here? 
So I start with uh, an initial str string, start with init. Maybe I should just use ABC. It's really easier. Uh, I killed it. Sorry. Let me go back all the way up. Def my string equals to dollar initial string modified. B. What should happen here? I'm missing a closing quote. <laughs> I am missing a closing quote and yeah, initial string. Thank you. Oh, what's that string playing at? Do, 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 do. Let's start from one simple one. Oh, well. Wow. Oh, it's going to, yeah. You're going to have to open a new Groovy shell, I think. Yep. So the Groovy shell is not perfect. It can occasionally get into a weird state and you have to restart it. Um, but as like a tool for mucking around, it's fine. But it's just, it can sometimes trip you up like that. Yep. So I have that. Def. My string. Sorry for the delay. Uh, in it goes to B. Line. There's also a Ruby um, console uh, string based, same, basically the same basic string version of that, uh, string, not the string. Yeah, that's Just nice. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Not init, my string. Yes, my string. Yeah. Yeah. So um, what I want to show you is init starts with A, and then you actually say you want a string interpolate it to my string. And then at that point where your string imp interpolated, my string now holds the value of A. So even if you change the value of init afterwards, it's still remembering that at this point in time during that history, it's actually um, interpolating uh, init as A. Now that's where this guy is useful. So if you're passing a closure there, what happens is it's going to de delay the evaluation until you actually need it. So in that case, it says you start with A. And then you have a closure there. You change it to B when you actually need it. Then it actually evaluate what the string is going to be. And I'll pass this back to John, because that's pretty much it for string manipulations and whatnot. Cool. Um, I'll try and make this one a little bit quick so I have some time for questions and just demoing some, some kind of interesting stuff. Um, so let's try and tackle that complicated looking method. If I can get this pin on. Sorry for anyone watching online. Ah, <laughs> uh, you have the gym. The gym guy is failing? Yep. All right, cool. Um, so I'll just put that one back then. Where are we? 48. Which was test? 48. 48 on the top. Oh, 48 on the top. James. Sorry, James. All right, cool. Um, so let's have a look first at the Java implementation just to remind you what that looks like. Um, Java, uh, not example. Oh, sorry, that's test. Java tools. Cool. So here we've got a function that takes a list and it makes a map out of it. Um, so what the expected output of this is, if you give it a list with an even number of items, uh, I'll show you the test here. So you give it a list with it with says key, value, and then you assert that um, when you get the key, it gives you the value. So it's making, this will be the key of the map, this will be the value. If you have more than one thing, it will do the same. It will just make two keys with two values. And if there's an uneven one, it will set the final odd one out to be null, as you can see here. Uh, and the way it achieves that is with the classic for loop. So it's going through. Um, adding up by two each time and then putting uh, this in the map and then doing a final check here to see if it was an odd list and then putting that in. Uh, by the way, this is not an algorithms talk, so there's probably a much better way to do this. Um, but um, just for demonstration purposes, this is what we have for now. So let's open up the groovy utils one. And actually, because we're going a bit over time, I do actually have one I prepared earlier. Um, so 
this is what it ends up looking like. So I'm going to explain a couple of these functions using the Groovy shell, mainly this collate thing, because it's not immediately obvious what this does, um, but it's a super useful tool. So if I open a Groovy shell somewhere. Yep, cool. So if I open a Groovy shell. If I have list with four items and I do a collate of two, it's going to return that. So what it does, the way it handles if you don't have the right number of things, it will just make, uh, say I have, what's the next number after four? Five, that's right. Um, so it'll make two, uh, a list of two items and then the final one, it'll just put the remainder in there. Um, so I'm utilizing that in this function. So here I'm going to get a list of lists each list will have two items in it. I know it's going to have two items in it because I'm collating with two. So I can say, okay, well, the first one is going to be the key. The second one is going to be the value. Uh, and you might be thinking to yourself, but hang on a minute, won't that result in an array out of bounds exception? Um, and the answer is no. So this will actually return null um, when it gets to the final one, if it's an odd one. And so here, unfortunately, this collect and each thing isn't going to return um, the result straight up. So I have to say map here. Um, but just to give you a bit of an example of how that looks compared to the Java one. If I can press the right buttons. So where's Java util? Here it is. So you can see it uh, ends up being quite a bit nicer. And also this is a good example to show you the assertion actually what it looks like when it fails because this gives you a much more interesting, uh, interesting output. So let me just find that. Uh, and then we might take questions really quick. Uh, a map. Let's call that value three or something. Uh, yep, value three. And then change that. So we just want to assert, assert, um, result is that. So we'll get a nice chunky failure. Should be good to demo that. Uh, control. Uh, let's just do a Gradle yep. clean test. Failed as we expected, and hopefully mm -hmm. that is still open. If we refresh, there. So you can see that's um, a slightly more interesting thing. So it's got the output, and it does its best to try and make that look nice. Um, so it prints a map with key value nicely there. Um, and if we did, for example, something slightly more complicated in the test, uh, so if we checked that, if we say cared only about uh, dot value three, uh, dot value dot, sorry, key two, two equaled rubbish, for example, which is not how you spell rubbish. This is also not a spelling talk, just so you know. Um, but if we quickly do a test on that, we can show you what that looks like, just so you can see that it prints out at each step of the thing. Refresh. There. So you can see it started off with the result. The result was a map with those two keys. It did dot key two and the result that it got there was value three. And then it tried to assert that on a poorly spelled rubbish and it failed. Um, so I think that's just about it. There was some other really, if I can just do this real quick, just to show you some really nice utility stuff that you can do. Um, if you um, so in Java, if I say null dot something, it's going to throw a null pointer exception. In Groovy, there is a utility thing called question mark dot. And if anything, if this returns null, then this will return null. So you don't get that null pointer exception. Um, and one more thing, if you have null and then question mark, this kind of looks like a ternary, right? Um, that's because it kind of is. So it's going to do a null check here. If that's not null, it's going to return that. If it is null, it's going to return this. So that's to um, essentially set up the, a value. So usually in ternary in Java, you would set, you have a property, and then I really don't want to return this. If it's null, I want to specify the property. So you check that. If it's not, then you return property. Otherwise, actually, in Java, you're actually going to do this instead. If it's null, please give me the default. Otherwise, it's OK to return property. So instead of doing that, you can then write. You're not in the groovy show anymore, yeah. I think. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cool. So there's more things that we're, we, we can show, and then there's other codes. Uh, but we'll, we'll open it 
to the question instead because we're a bit over time. So yeah. Shoot. Yeah. an example where you changed it and it used the original, oh sorry, it used the original value that you had set. If you change it, if you call that again, will it use the one that it assessed or will it use the, the old value? I, I, I know what you mean, so it's a good question. So I think the, the question boils down to um, if, if you have a closure in your groovy string, um, will it just retain the value that it that it had when you first called it in subsequent calls, or will it still dynamically assess what the value should be? I think, is that the question? Yeah. Yep, yep, cool. Um, so I'm not 100% sure, but I, I'm pretty sure that it will evaluate the closure each time. And so because the closure refers to the variable, if you update that variable again, it should use the latest, um, the latest sort of value that that variable's taken okay. at the time you call it. My understanding is that, um, whenever it sees that, it's actually creating an, an anonymous method, which is like it treated as an object. And that's another thing with Ruby. We treat, they treat um, closures or functions as first class citizens. So you can treat it as an object. And then if you think of, of it as an, a new instance of a method, then it's actually a different instance. So. Sorry, what was that? Any? Yes. Oh, yes, 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 yes. So, yeah. Another thing that we failed to show or we haven't shown because uh, there's not enough time is the interop between Java and Groovy. Very nice. Hopefully it's uh, quite obvious from the way when we convert stuff and the fact that we can actually find errors if we didn't rename the person class to Groovy person. It is actually, uh, for example, in the test, if you didn't rename it in the Groovy test, it's still able to test um, the Java classes. In fact, that's one of the patterns that we use in uh, our project or uh, in the projects that I've seen. Uh, if they're not comfortable yet to actually change the source codes into Groovy, you can definitely write the test in Groovy. So you can just write test in Groovy. That's an initial or a, a slightly cheaper, easier way to uh, introduce people to Groovy, mm -hmm. less risk. And then the test is in Groovy. It's able to access Java classes. And you get the nicety of that assert um, as well. And also in Java, you can even access the Groovy class. So because in Groovy, um, if we just take a look um, at the, or maybe not take a look, but if you remember the person class, all those uh, instant, all those field definitions, we're actually creating getters and setters. Um, so in Java, you can just use those getters and setters. You can't use any of the nice Groovy notation, but you can totally use the Groovy person class in Java. You just need to say like dot get name or dot get dob or whatever. So it's quite nice that way. If you are forced to write something in in Java because not all libraries actually uh, work well with Groovy. Most of them do, like probably 90% or something. Um, but every now and then you will find one that has a few quirks, so you're going to have to write it something in Java. But it's nice that when you have to do that, you can still use all your Groovy stuff. Yeah, good question. I'm not sure. No, no, go ahead. Yeah. So I can't, but that's, it's in the extended syntax where you've got the, the XSA group artifact version and then you go, X, like I think it's X that's... Um, okay. Right, but that yeah, the, essentially um, that's the dependency that you need to change? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Why should I use Groovy instead of Java? I mean, in which project 
do you think it's preferable to use Ruby? So I'm, I'm speaking from the perspective of the developer. So and having been able to compare both Java and Ruby, um, I, I personally found Ruby is more terse. It's uh, in order to achieve the same amount of stuff, you write much less code. Terse code means less bugs, or at least less chance to actually uh, introduce bugs. It also means that the, the next developer that comes in and they need to re read your code, they would probably read less amount of code to understand what the, the thing you're, you're supposed to achieve, so less ceremonial code. I would opt to use Groovy in almost anything that would use that otherwise I would use Java for um, going forward. Um, it does, however, comes with some penalties, but we'll compare it with other frameworks. Groovy, you can talk about performance. Yeah, yeah, sure. So Groovy um, is obviously dynamically typed, and there's overhead associated with that. So typically, um, I think in the benchmarks that I saw, Groovy was typically between two to eight times slower than Java. Um, however, there is a compile static annotation that you can annotate your classes with, and that will disable a lot of that dynamic stuff. So even with that, though, that'll, that'll push your performance down to be more like two times slower than Java. Um, but it's still faster than um, a lot of the other scripting languages. But yeah, you do have to bear in mind it is definitely slower. But you have to compare it, for example, with frameworks like JRuby, because Groovy, for example, if you compare it with things like a scripting language, it's still yeah. way faster than things that you would probably run in JRuby. And also from a readability point of view, if you're used to coding in Java, it's very easy to read Groovy code for the most part. There's some weird stuff like that collate method that you'll probably have to look up, but for the most part, it's quite intuitive. Um, unlike, say, like, like for me anyway, I know Clojure, you get very nice, concise code. Um, but if you're not familiar with the language, it's, a lot, it's quite difficult to read and wrap your head around initially. So that's nice as well. I would suggest people to try it. Scala uh, has an unfair advantage of Martin being behind um, Scala, Martin Dresky, which will also works in tuning JVM. So Scala is definitely tuned for performance. Groovy doesn't have that benefit. Groovy is actually it's like some additional utility functions written on top of Java and a lot of syntactic sugar, as well as type inference and the fact that it's dynamic type and whatever. So it's not really tuned for performance, but you don't get that much of a hit. Yeah, totally, totally. So um, from what I've seen, so it can be up to eight times slower than Java, but when you put your compile static, it's usually around two times slower. So it's still not going to be as fast, um, but it's faster, totally faster. It's, worth, it's probably worth adding, though, that when it is tuned, um, that people have done benchmarks and whatever, that they actually say Ruby's not that much slower. So you can be actually on, on par Java-wise. Mm. Yeah, I think it's arbitrary code, right? It's arbitrary code. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it's just arbitrary groovy code. Yeah, yeah, arbitrary groovy code. Typically, you don't want to put like yeah. war and peace <laughs> into it. But yeah. You don't want to go too crazy, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Well, uh, I don't represent Groovy, obviously. Yeah, no. um, uh, um, my my, my, my feel is um, there's definitely still some benefits in terms of. There's 
Sorry, there's definitely still some um, benefits in using Groovy in terms of like, I, I don't know when Java is going to start introducing a type inference or even it, it. Java being a statically compiled language and everything is type safe also brings it its own trade off. <coughs> Groovy, the, the paradigm is really scripting, dynamic type, type inference and, or late binding and whatnot. So um, that's, that's it, it has its own place, I think. Unfortunately, I, I, I'm not entirely sure why it hasn't picked up and why the popularity hasn't gone the way it should have. Uh, but it definitely still has its place. I, I think uh, eventually Groovy is going to find its own niche in terms of application. And then that would give uh, the answer towards like why we choose Java or Groovy uh, a better and clearer answer. But at the moment, uh, I opt for Groovy just because even with Java Lambda, Lambda expression and whatnot, it's still a, a more terse code mm -hmm. and easier to read code in Groovy. Yeah, like and performance. Uh, like runtime performance is a, is a trade off, right? So you're trading off developer productivity. Yeah, exactly. Right, exactly. Performance, which is which is so you you're getting you're able to write pro code faster and do things faster from a development point of view, but you're trading off performance, right? Yeah. So you can do more with less. Yeah. Like in other words, you can do, have less developers and produce you know, more pro more productive more productive functional code as opposed to, and trade off performance. Right? I would argue even not only productivity but future productivity as well, which is right, maintainability right. and, and stuff. Almost like DSL is very uh, group area for yep. Groovy. Yeah, yeah. Because you can avoid the semicolons and yep. you can avoid the paragraphs and still close the loop. Yeah, right. and that's what like Fox is basically yeah. just yeah. DSL. Yeah. And, and even Gradle Groovy as well. Uh, I think we're going to Yeah, we should probably it wrap it up. Because, um, yeah. <laughs> Thanks for the enthusiasm, worried. though. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah. Yeah. So Thank you all. Give a big round of applause to John and Penny. I think.